I wish I could say, Troy, I've got this down and I just nail it. Uh, all I can tell you is that the bigger my platform gets, the more criticism I get and the more I ask myself, honestly, is this worth it? Hey guys, welcome to the Troy Grambling Podcast. I am so glad that you're here. It is uh, just a great joy to talk to so many different people. And that's a really our heart, is to talk to interesting people, learn a little bit about them and how we can all reach our potential. If you go back, we've talked to bakers, we've talked to professional athletes, we've talked, my, this, is what I'm, this is what I'm hoping to do. I wanna talk to a professional wrestler. Uh, but that hasn't happened yet. I grew up Jerry the King Law or Bill Dundee. Anyways, today's guest is not a professional wrestler, but uh, somebody I am really, really excited for you uh, to meet, Dr. Sean McDowell. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on. That is the most unique introduction I've ever had as not being a wrestler. So let's just go with it. <laughs> yeah, I, I just think they would have something interesting to uh, I agree. To say. I grew up in Arkansas. Memphis was just down the road. They had okay. Saturday morning wrestling. Yep. And that's the only thing I really ever remember. Me, I got two brothers. I'm the oldest. And then my dad, he was always working. But at 10 o'clock on Saturday, before we would go play basketball little peewee basketball mm. we would watch wrestling great memory <laughs> so i got to talk to a professional wrestler a little bit of psychology you didn't major in psychology nope. too did you nope but uh anyways i wanted to talk to you just about life i know you uh well first of all tell us because you're an apologist i would tell us what that is yeah so we had somebody call up Biola University where I teach and they're upset because we had classes on teaching people how to apologize for their faith <laughs> An example is somebody who does not understand what apologetics is. It comes from multiple times in the scriptures. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Sanctify Christ as the Lord. Always be ready with an answer for the hope within. Give it with uh, gentleness and respect. The word answer or reason in the Greek is apologia. So apologetics, it's not a spiritual discipline. It's not just for pastors or Bible teachers. It's actually something all Christians are called to be ready with an answer. Why do you believe the Bible is true? Why do you believe that Jesus is God? Why does God allow evil? How do you make sense of science and faith? These big questions are the task of apologetics. And uh, I, you have a YouTube. I love you. You got a podcast as well and all the social media, but I love your YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And you really deal with a wide range of uh uh, different topics uh, along the way. And I just encourage anybody that has questions uh, about their faith to go uh, check that out. I appreciate uh, well, the topics you. that you take on uh, and the way you do. Mm -hmm. I I'm going to give you, well, okay. I don't know how you're going to feel about this. Okay. It's a compliment. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. You remind me of a friend. I told our executive pastor earlier, he said, I've never heard Sean mm -hmm. speak. And I said, and you're going to tell me if you, anybody's ever compared you to this person, Joel Osteen. Uh, that would be a first. And, and, and here's the reason why you have such a hmm. pleasant spirit, you know, watching you, uh, online, um, no matter what subject you're dealing with and, um, and, and, you know, you deal with it boldly. You, you probably have a more forceful hmm. personality than, than Joel does, but, but your pleasantness, no matter what you're dealing with. So I mean that as a, as a compliment. Oh, that, that's totally a compliment. I appreciate that a ton. Uh -huh. And uh, that's what I told him. I said that, and I, I have to talk to him and see if he agrees now, but that's what, uh, so you, your father is uh, an apologist as well. Mm -hmm. I, and uh, I remember years ago I met him and uh, he, he wrote a book. I don't remember the title of it, but it talked about truth and it talked about how truth wasn't a principle or it was mm -hmm. a person and, and yeah. it really made a difference uh, in, in my life. But I want to ask you, growing up in an apologist home, mm. did you have doubt? If you did, how did you deal with the process of trusting Christ and then just wrestling with all those different questions? That's a great question. I didn't really have doubt until I was 19 years old in college, this is mid nineties. And so the internet is just taking off. There's no Google yet, et cetera. But I think I, I think I can't remember if I was freshman, sophomore in college. And I'm searching around the internet, trying to figure out what this thing is. And I come across this atheist site committed to debunking Christianity. 
and they took my dad's book mm. chapter by chapter. And there were doctors, historians, lawyers, really intelligent people dissecting arguments that I thought were just knocked down and nobody could even challenge them at that stage in my life. And that really unsettled me intellectually and emotionally. It was really the first time I had the thought I could be wrong about this. Mm. So I remember going to my dad sometime later. I don't remember how long, long it was, but probably within the next two, three months, we were in Breckenridge, Colorado and asked him if we got to get coffee and we sat down and I said, dad, I want to know what's true, but I don't know that I'm convinced Christianity is really true. Not knowing what my dad's going to say, who's been an apologist now for six decades, written or co-written 150 books, just lives a, a, a modern day apostle Paul type life. And he looked at me, he didn't miss a beat, Troy. He looks at me, he goes, son, I think that's great. And I literally didn't think he was even listening to what I was saying. I was like, did you hear what I said? He goes, you can't live on my convictions. You have to decide for yourself what you think is true. He said, don't reject the things you've learned growing up. Some people do out of spite. Only reject it if you're convinced that it's false. If you seek after truth, I'm confident you'll follow Jesus because Jesus is the truth. And they said something like, your mom and I will love you no matter what. And that really freed me up. I'm not sure I stopped believing. That was really the first time I was like, I got to read books. I got to think about this and decide if I'm going to bank my life on this. That was pivotal. Mm. Some time after that is when I really not only realized Christianity was true, but I think it pierced my heart. I don't, I mean, it was within the next year or two. I just remember profoundly just being convicted of my own sin in a way I hadn't before. And I had really prided myself without realizing I'm not doing the big sins we talked about in the 90s. Right. And I was better than them and all that kind of stuff. I would have never said that. People probably would have thought I was humble, but it really hit me like, holy cow, I am so arrogant and so prideful, mm -hmm. like the older son rather than the prodigal son. And it's like, God just broke my heart and softened me. And I would say, I really began to experience God's grace firsthand at that point. Wow. Because I think sometimes um, we're afraid to to share our doubts, mm. you know, especially we grow up in a Christian home. And I think sometimes as parents, um, they're not sure how to respond, especially in today's world, there's such fear of people deconstructing and, and all those yeah. things. you have any advice? I mean, I know you have three kids as well. I do. Yeah. So there's some research that's come out of Fuller Theological Seminary, and it's in a series called Sticky Faith. And what they argued, which I think is true, is that it's not doubt that hijacks a young person's faith. It's unexpressed doubt mm. that hijacks their faith. So, so many times in churches, Christian homes, Christian schools, people don't feel the freedom to ask questions. And so the doubt begins to fester like a cancer. And then eventually you're going to deconstruct to the point of deconversion. Mm. So I, like when my kids have questions, I'll say, what a good question. Way to go. What do you think? And we'll talk about it. I'm not afraid of tough mm -hmm. questions. I invite tough questions. In fact, I'm an apologist and my job is to give answers to thoughtful questions. But I think it's as important, if not more, for Christians to just say, I believe in God and here's why. But I have doubts. I have questions. Mm -hmm. And to just show that it's okay to live and have a robust faith with questions. I think if anybody today doesn't have some questions or doubts, they're not being honest with themselves. I mean, especially with the access to the internet right. to not only challenges to our faith, but so many other belief systems, it's natural to have questions. The last thing I would say is I'd encourage people to realize that doubt is not the opposite of faith. The unbelief is mm. the opposite of faith. Mm. You can believe something and have doubts. Mm. When I began to realize that if you're 50-50 on something, it's literally 50-50. If you're 51-49, you believe it, but that's a really weak belief. I begin to realize that there's different levels of strength that we can have for beliefs. So if I'm 60-40, how do I get to 65, 70, 75, 80? And if we look at faith in that fashion, then we're okay with doubts and we invite doubts. Mm. Since Christianity is true, there's actually answers if we're willing to seek them. Yeah, and you, you think about that, you think then doubt really can drive us to greater understanding. Amen. If we'll 
it, you know, if we're truly looking uh, for answers, I remember our oldest son, he, we were in Michigan visiting my grandma and he came up, but he's probably only in fifth grade. He, he was, wow. and he's like, uh, but I was already a pastor and everything. And he's like, dad, I, I don't think Jesus is real. Wow. Like and, uh, uh, I just, you know, I remember that cause, and I, I remember, you know, that idea of if, if I, you know, cause mm. we're, in some ways as parents, then you have to decide, do you believe it's real? Because if it's real, then God's big enough, you know, to take care of Amen. that. And if they're truly seeking, that's where they're gonna gonna end up. Why do you think? Or uh, let me not even ask it that way. It seems like there's lots of folks that are deconstructing. Is there more? Um, and when I say that, I'm talking about folks who maybe have been in the faith for, you know, pastors. I, I remember on your channel, you guys uh, were talking about a book that a pastor had wrote. Uh, we see musicians. Mm -hmm. Is there more of that or is it just we're more aware of it because of the the Internet, do you think? Or is there a cause? Or It's hard to know if there's more or not. Uh, it's certainly with technology, it allows two things. It allows us to hear more stories than we would have in the past and also allows us to just kind of have a medium to raise questions and encourage people to question their faith and deconstruct in a way that couldn't in the past. So I suspect there's more. Now, look, you, you might recognize the name Tony Campolo, his uh -huh. son Bart Campolo. Bart deconstructed and became deconverted to become a humanist, an atheist. Mm -hmm. And when he was an atheist chaplain, there was a huge write-up about his story. I think I can't remember if it was in the LA Times or what paper it is in. No paper like that has done a story on me. Now, I'm not saying they should. I'm not jealous. That's not my point. <laughs> but somebody who deconstructs and their dad is an evangelist or a pastor or a musician, like you said, that's a more interesting mm. story than apologist son becomes magic unapologist. You're a pastor, <laughs> your son becomes a <laughs> that's pastor. Right. That's just not as interesting to people. So I don't think the stories get told as much. Now, is there a cause? I don't think there's one cause. I think there's a lot of contributing factors to it. So Proverbs 20 verse five says, the purposes in a man's heart are deep and a man of wisdom draws it out. Whenever somebody has questions or doubts or they say I'm deconstructing, my question is what's, what's the question beneath the question? What's the real issue that's going on? Some people it might be intellectual. For a lot of people, it's emotional. For many people, it's relational. Sometimes it's moral. I wanna know what the root core issue is and then try to address it accordingly. Mm. No, that's good. And, I, I, and you know, I, I think of some of the folks that uh, that I've seen walk down this road online are, and a lot of times they're folks I would have never known mm. without that that medium, or they would have been uh, uh, thought of as celebrities. You know, and I think in my lifetime, lots of celebrities who, I mean, I don't know how sincere their faith was, but they proclaimed a faith that after sure. you know being. Um, within that field for a while, they, they tend to, to walk away from it. So you are a professor. So That's you're right. around, uh, the college kids. Um, any difference in the, 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 what you see in college kids today, as opposed to in years past, as far as how they're coming into school or. Uh, so let's take like Gen Z. What's, what's about Gen Z. Obviously, the defining characteristic of Gen Z is they are a truly digital generation. So many college students today, which would be older Gen Zers, were raised swiping smartphones and iPads before many could speak or even read. I'm still not sure we know yet what that does to the brain and to the relationships and how it affects somebody long term. So the key to understand this generation is through digital technology. One way I, I put it, it's kind of a principle, is that I'm a Gen Xer. And so by default, I communicate offline. Then I've learned how to communicate online. This is a generation that by default communicates online and has to learn how to communicate offline. Mm. So that's a huge factor of this generation. We've also seen massive increase in mental illness, depression and anxiety, Gen Z, they will define themselves as the loneliest generation. Now we're seeing that across generations, but they're still at a pivotal, 
pivotal maturing, growing up age. So when you talk with Gen Zers a lot, not all of them, but many of them will talk about mental health and they're struggling with the, these issues more than generations in the past. I think there's a generation that's dialed into things like social justice. Now, sometimes social justice maps up with biblical justice. Sometimes it doesn't. Mm. But that's a lot of the issues being talked about and being promoted and being kind of pushed in the culture where this generation is today. But overall, I am optimistic about this generation. College students I work with, at least the students at Biola are amazing and they're remarkable and they're making a difference for God and they want to know the truth. So I just remind people that look at this generation and feel like, what is going on? I don't understand. Is there any hope? I'd say you and I have far more in common with this generation than we do differences because of our shared humanity. Mm. And there's a lot of potential in this generation if we'll lean in and equip them and build relationships with them. We're already seeing God use Gen Zers in a remarkable way. And it, you know, sometimes you think about it because of media, social media, even our perspective on these generations are That's right. You, you, in other words, we're not we're not even looking at a real person and making, a, you know, a comment about <laughs> them. We're looking at comments and then making comments about. You know, I agree. When it comes for example, you know, you value education, you hear lots of opinions about that in today's world. So as a, a Christian couple and they've, you know, they've got a couple of teenagers or they're going to be teenagers and what should they be doing to prepare their kids for, mm. um, you know, for university or, and how seriously should they take uh, a Christian university as a, as a, opposed to a state school or something to that effect? Two great questions. Let's take the first one. If you could sum up the data on passing on your faith. I think you would say that three things give you the best chance of passing on to the next generation. Number one, you got a model of faith that a kid finds attractive and appealing. If you don't model it and live it, of course, not perfectly, but authentically, doesn't matter what you and I say. Mm -hmm. Number one is model. Number two is build intimate, close relationships with our kids. Relationships are the key. The largest study I'm aware of of faith transmission, 3,500 people, 35 years, four generations by a scholar named Vern Bankston at USC. He published in a book with Oxford Press called Families in Faith. And they said the single most significant factor in faith transmission is a quote, warm relationship with the father. Mm -hmm. I mean, just let that sink in. A warm relationship with the father. So model the faith. Number two, build relationships with your kids. And then number three, have meaningful spiritual conversations about life. In the rhythm of life, have conversations about God mm. that help this generation think Christianly. So someone told me the other day, they're like, hey, it's like Mr. T. And I was like, what are you talking about? They said M model, right? R is relationship. And T is talk with your kids. So I will remember that because I will love Mr. T. You can remember that. That's what the data shows. Now, universities, I'm a huge fan of Christian schools. I teach at Biola University. I think many, not all universities have embraced a worldview that is deeply opposed to a Christian worldview. Some universities more than others. I was just reading about Harvard University, interestingly enough, and I can't remember if it was Democrats to Republicans or conservatives to liberals, but it was literally 88 to one. Wow. 88 to one. Now, not all schools are that high, but you go back 20, 30 years ago and you're seeing a radical shift. And my point was not that Republicans are Christians and Democrats <laughs> are not. I don't want anybody, that is not my point, but I'm saying so many universities are one-sided how they see the world, how they see politics, mm -hmm. how they see culture and as a whole, not friendly to a Christian worldview. Now, are there some Christian kids that can thrive in a public school? Of course they can, of course they can. There's some kids that'll thrive at a place like Harvard that are Christians. But I'm telling you, given the worldview, not only of professors, but it's actually a lot of studies show that it's their peers that have as much or more influence than mm. professors do. That's why I went to Biola and I believe in it. And there's some great Christian schools around here. You surround yourself with the Christian faculty, you surround yourself with Christian kids, at least for that season. That is just to me, 
one of the most important things to do with the next generation. Oh, that's that's good. And I think it's a question that a lot of folks are, you know, trying to figure out because they want to see their kids uh, do well. You know, you uh, mentioned uh, talking with your kids. And one of the things that I've always shared here at Potential is or at what Steph and I experienced in our mm. parenting. It, and they get to determine that. Like we always made ourselves available when they wanted to talk. Because when I wanted to talk, the, you know, I mean, if they didn't want to, it wasn't much of a conversation. Yeah, dad. Okay. You know, and, and they always wanted to talk at bad time. You know, I'm ready to go to bed and they're oh. ready to talk, you know? And, uh, but man, those were the best, mm. um, uh, conversations. And I, I think if we make ourselves available, um, we think, I think sometimes because they don't want to talk when we want to talk, that they don't want to talk as opposed mm. to making ourselves available when they're really ready to uh, communicate. Just, just a couple more questions. I, sure. You mentioned uh, the role the father plays. Hmm. What do you think are some things, uh, you know, most churches are more effective at reaching uh, females or women than they are uh, men, you know? Hmm. Um, what are some things we can do to be more effective in uh, reaching men with the gospel, seeing them uh, engage in the life of the church, um, anything that you've noticed? That is such a good question. I got to be totally honest with you. That is a little bit outside of my lane. All I can tell you is if I was a pastor, what I would do is I would get three or four or five men from my community who I respect, who care about the church. I'd bring them together and I say, what are the needs of men in our community? How do we equip them? What what do people love doing here? Because one church's community and culture might be totally different than another community and culture. Here in Florida, it might be very different than California. Actually, we know it's very different than California. So I think I would just bring together some key folks in my church. I would listen to them. I'd brainstorm with them. I would get them on board, find out what those needs are, and then intentionally reach out to equip those men and not assume that the way we've been doing things is the way we need to keep doing things. That's the best I can do. Right. I'm not a pastor. That's not my lane, but that's probably how I would try to tackle that. Yeah, I think sometimes uh, change is it's not, you know. I agree. Being willing to to look at things in a fresh way and, and a new way. Let me ask you, you're, as an apologist, you you're deal with questions. Uh, some of those things are controversial in the world in which mm. we live. You deal with them in a public way. Um, mm. How do you deal with criticism and a personal, uh, on a personal side? That is a great question. I wish I could say, Troy, I've got this down and I just nail it. Uh, all I can tell you is that the bigger my platform gets, the more criticism I get. And the more I ask myself, honestly, is this worth it? Mm -hmm. Now, I think it's worth it because I believe in what I'm doing. But I have no illusions that, wow, if I just doubled the size of my YouTube channel, then I'd be happy. Like, no, if anything, that would double the amount of criticism mm -hmm. and trouble. But I love what I do. I believe that I'm called for a deeper purpose. Try to have integrity in terms of what I do. And so I can put my head down on my pillow at night. Uh, in terms of specifically dealing with criticism, I will read some comments because I need to know what people are saying. I don't sit there and read all the comments especially right before I go to bed, it'll ruin my sleep. Uh, sometimes if something really bothers me, I'll talk it out. Typically not with my wife because I don't want to dump that on her, but right. I have friends that do what I do and go, hey, what do you think about this? Am I handling this well? And try to process it. Um, what else do I do? I just, I guess for me, I, I'm driven by principles that motivate what I do. And so if I believe I'm doing something that's valuable and good and it's true, then I can take some of the criticism that comes with it. It's mm -hmm. like you and I both played college basketball. If you have a deeper goal, you're willing to put yourself through some pain to get better to get mm -hmm. there. That's kind of how I look at criticism. I go, mm -hmm. I have a goal of what I want to accomplish. I love what I do. I feel equipped and called to train and equip people and evangelize. And this comes with it. So I try to filter it through what I know to be true. And the times if I'm really discouraged, I'm like, you know what? I'm just getting off anything social media for the entire weekend. I'm not reading any comments. I'm going to go talk with somebody. I'm going for a run and just give it a break. 
but yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. It is a constant challenge right. to deal with feedback like that, to admit, okay, I blew it there, could be better. That's good feedback. That's nonsense, not worth listening to. It's just a constant conversation that I'm trying to work through. You know, it's, uh, it's it, it, like you said, playing in sports, there's a scoreboard. And I, I remember when I went into mm. ministry, uh, you know, there are people say there are different scoreboards, but people don't even agree on what the scoreboard is. You know what I mean? So somebody over here looks and says, wow, you hit a home run. And somebody over here is like, that's terrible. You know, yeah, anything that has a sense of art to it is so subjective of whether or not you're mm -hmm. succeeding at what you're trying to do. Um, and, and being able to focus on what, you know, God thinks about it is, uh, is challenging, but I just remember when I first, you mm. know, playing basketball, it's like, we're winning or we're losing, you know, that it's, it's objective, it's right? right there. Everybody knows it, you know, That's you might a not good like way to idea, think about it. We were doing well. You know, um, the other thing on top of that, if I could throw in there is I do have certain people in my life that are going to give me an objective, honest assessment. I have certain mentors and people I call and I'll say, Hey, here's some criticism I got. And what do you think? And I completely trust what they're going to tell me. Mm -hmm. So you can filter out a lot of the voices. That's more, that's as objective of a scoreboard as I can get. Yeah. Well, I appreciate what you do. I think it, it, uh, it I think it makes a difference and I think mm. it's very accessible, you know, um, even with what you shared tonight, I thought you did, uh, you do a, a really good job of being able to, to speak to everybody, to speak mm. to those that might have intellectual challenges but also speak at a level that everybody can engage in, in what you're sharing and what you're saying and, and uh, all the other things, your books as well. I've enjoyed uh, reading for that, uh, for that reason. Well, I'd like to end our time if we could. I thought one of the questions that we had uh, tonight after teaching was about, and it's a very common question, it's pain, you know, when, how do we believe in a God mm. that seems to allow us or someone we love to go through pain? Mm. And and I thought that your um, that your answer was uh, was inspiring and could help a lot of people to give purpose mm. to to what they're going through. So I, I thought mm. we would uh, close our time if you would just to 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 share some of those same uh, thoughts about if somebody out there it, it is really having a hard time with God because it seems unfair what mm. they're going through the the pain for them or someone that they love. Mm. This really is the question that people ask. It's not academic. It's something we've experienced or our loved ones have experienced. And we look at God, we're like, you have the power and you're good. Why don't you fix it? So it's natural to cry out to God. This is not a foreign question. You look in the Bible, Job is wrestling with this. You see Jesus saying, take this cup away from me. Paul suffered. This question is one everybody has to wrestle with. Well, how do we make sense of it Christianly? I think one reason that God maybe allows us to suffer is it's actually one of the most powerful draws for people to the Christian faith when Christians suffer well. Now, why would that be the case? Because anybody can say they believe anything, but then when the chips are down, you know if somebody really believes something or not. It's fine to worship God when your life is going great, but when you're in pain and you're hurting, then you only worship God if you really believe it. And as you know, this is not academic for me. This fall for about two to three months, I was in the worst pain of my life where sometimes I would literally be lying on my back for like two, three, four hours, just taking a breath at a time, trying to get through the pain. I'm not going to say I sat there and was like, thank you for this, Jesus. Like that would be a complete lie. But I remember saying, God, help me suffer. Help me suffer well. I don't understand the purpose, but I want, all I want to do is glorify you through this. And even the early church, it's like Christians are being thrown to lions and they're being persecuted and they believed God through it. And the world would look in and be like, wow, they have something I don't have. Where does that hope come from? Where does that confidence come from? Where does that faith come from? And it draws people to the kingdom. In fact, one of the great scientists of our day wrote a book on DNA and God. It was actually, he was an atheist and he was at hospice watching people die. And these Christians suffered and died with a peace. And he just couldn't make sense of that. 
and got C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, and you know how the rest of the story goes. So I think one reason is, and by the way, the Bible never promises we're not going to suffer. It promises that God is there with us and he's going to redeem it for good. And ultimately we'll be in a place where there is no suffering and there is no pain. Mm. I think that's one reason why God allows us to suffer. I think a ton more can be said about that. But if we'd shift our focus and just say, God, give me the strength to suffer well, what does it mean to suffer well? I think that would change our perspective of suffering and be a powerful testimony to the world. Uh, that's incredible. You know, as I, we were collected uh, questions all uh, for the last two or three weeks because we knew Michelle was going to be here and mm -hmm. answer some of those questions. And for me, it was just a little overwhelming. It, it, you know, like sure. I've given, I've been, Steph and I have been here for 24 years. I've been in ministry for over 30 years as a pastor. And you just sometimes feel overwhelmed. You mm. know, how do you answer all these questions? How do you, mm. um, you know, especially in the world in which we live and there's so much noise. And as you shared uh, earlier, I thought, well, that's something we can all do. That's something I can do. I, I can suffer um, Amen. well. And, uh, uh, as, and so in a sense, it, it was encouraging to be reminded, you know, that um, we can all do that. We're all Can I be it. presumptuous and jump in? Here's a here's a series for you in the future to do. Take the toughest 10 questions that people submitted and do a 10-part series, just doing your best, making sense of those. Wow. That's an amazing series. You don't have to have all the answers. Read a couple of books, watch some videos, maybe interview some people and just say, I don't have it all figured out, but here's some ways I think about it. Just having that conversation would be gold. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. Well, it's great to have you. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. I want to encourage you to subscribe, share, and uh, don't forget. Oh, I forgot. I got a book coming out June the 11th. It is called Potential, the Uncontainable Power of God Within You. If there's anything that uh, is always on my heart, I, this is the way I parent, it's the way I pastor, it's the kind of friend that I am, is to challenge people to reach their potential. God created you to do some incredible things. And the best way to glorify Him is by being what He created you to be, what He had in His mind, what He knit you together in your mother's order. You can actually pre-order this it, uh, wherever you pre-order stuff. Hey, it's great to have you. We'll be back next Thursday. We love you guys and uh, God bless.